Okay, it's day 193, September 4th. Here is what is going on today. Uh, I'm going to start with the intelligence update from Britain. Russian forces continue to suffer from morale and discipline issues in Ukraine, in addition to combat fatigue and high casualties. And there's been a lot of that. Uh, one of the main grievances is pay. And it goes on and on about how uh, the pay is complexly designed and there's probably some uh, delays from bureaucracy and there's probably even some uh, delays from corruption of military leaders who have their hands in the pocket, like as if they couldn't have other problems like lack of motivation, getting run through a wood chipper, and now they're going to get this on top of that. So the Russian military has significant issues. Okay, here is Zelensky talking to Europeans about, this was yesterday actually, um, but it's carried today. Russia is preparing a divisive, uh, decisive energy blow on all Europeans this winter. Um, so to put this in context, what Russia did was say, well, we're just going to indefinitely shut down the Nord Stream pipeline. And then they blamed the Europeans for not shipping stuff. But I, I don't have time to cover that in this in this presentation. Uh, Russia is trying these days to increase energy pressure on Europe even more the pump pumping of gas through Nord Stream has been completely stopped Russia wants to destroy the normal life of every European he says then he goes on okay he also reported on today's news which is about what's going on in um, in you know the offensive right so he's going to talk about this uh, and says uh, on Sunday, he marked progress as a counteroffensive. Now you have to, as a leader, you can't like, I, I, okay, we get it. You have to keep something secret, at least in the short term, in order to not tip your hand to the enemy. But you can't do that too long. You have to be able to reveal like what's actually happening because people really, really want to know. He did not say precisely where the territories were and provided no timeline except that he had received some good reports. In his nightly video address, Zelensky thanked his forces for liberating a settlement in the eastern Donetsk region and taking a certain height in an area in the eastern Lusitschansk service direction. Okay, And he was also talking about like good things in uh, and the counteroffensive as well. So, so there's something there. Now let's let's get a little bit deeper with that, and we can do that by going to the ISW. The Institute for the Study of War does a great job with this. The Ukrainian counteroffensive is making verifiable progress in the south and east. Ukrainian forces are advancing along several axes in western Kherson Oblast and have secured territory in the Seversky Donetsk River in Donetsk Oblast. So that's what what Zelensky was just talking about. But then they went on and said some fascinating things. Okay, Ukrainian President Zelensky announced that Ukrainian forces liberated two unarmed, uh, unnamed settlements in southern Ukraine and one settlement in Donetsk. That's what we just talked about. But now this. Now the Russians have been denying any artillery coming from Zaporizhia. So I'm, highly, I'm making this larger just so that nobody's unclear. Geolocated footage from September 2nd to 3rd shows Russian forces firing MLRS rounds, that's these big artillery pieces, from positions on the grounds of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Who would have thought the Russians lied about this? Hey, there's nothing. Go back to yesterday, and you, I'm showing you the Russians saying, no, nope, there is there is no artillery here. We uh, we don't have any artillery on the pres on the grounds of the, the uh, nuclear power plant. Yeah, on the ground, geolocated footage on the grounds of the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant within one kilometer of a nuclear reactor. I mean, come on, guys. Like, you, you know that people can see stuff with drones and satellites now, right? Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov stated that Russia is ready to negotiate. Huh. It's ready to negotiate on their terms, but they're, they're ready to negotiate. And you're going to hear more of that as time goes on, uh, a lot more of that. And then they're going to try to spin it as if, Ukraine's the aggressor. Uh, the negotiated conditions for ending a Russian war in Ukraine on September 4th, but the Kremlin is maintaining its maximalist goals to denazify. Denazification also means a uh, the military op operation will lead to regime change in Kyiv. But that's that's not likely to happen. Uh, it's also going to mean the surrender of all Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Russian efforts to integrate Kherson and Zaporizhia and Kharkiv oblasts demonstrate that they expect to keep those as well. Now, why does that matter? Well, because when you're looking at things like this, uh, Ukraine war history is rewritten for children in occupied areas. This is what children are being taught. 
Uh, and this is a teacher saying, what really bothers me about the Russian curriculum is what they'll be taught in history. So what, well, what are they being taught? Most references to Ukraine and Kiev were removed. Even Kiev and Rus, the name of medieval Eastern European state with its capital of Kiev, was replaced with Rus or just old Rus. Books include false statements about that during the Russian annexing of Crimea in 2014, people came out to protect their rights. No, that, that wasn't what was going on. Radical nationalists came to power with the support of the West, but it was actually that the Russians infiltrated. It wasn't just like mass protests. And Okay, the BBC contacted the Russians' Ministry of Enlightenment. Okay, if you have a Ministry of Enlightenment, that's it's probably not enlightening. It's probably more of a propaganda kind of arm. That's uh, anyway, parents who refuse to send their children uh, for in-person teaching would be stripped of parental rights. Now, that's freaking evil, right? Uh, on August 24th, the Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin announced the one-off payment of 10,000 rubles for parents as long as their kids attend school by September 15th. So there's a carrot and a stick. The stick is you're going to lose your rights. And hey, yeah, if you come, you get this bonus uh, just for sending your children to school. Okay, so that's what's at stake here. Let's keep moving. Um, a couple other interesting articles. Ukraine pitched to Australia. This is from a Australian paper, the Sydney Morning Herald. I don't quote from there here too often just because it's not terribly relevant usually. But Ukraine has launched a bold, uh, a bold bid for its army to be used as a guinea pig for cutting edge military technology. Now, the Australians had given uh, a number of Bushmasters. That's these large vehicles that you see here. Um, uh, Zelensky pitched when he talked to their the, to their government early on in the war and said, "You you have this Bushmaster vehicle. We it could really help us." The very next day, these were donated, um, and these Hawkeyes are really impressive. That's these smaller ones, and uh, he said they're still in testing mode and now being introduced to the uh, to the Australian military. He said they help us in the war. They or they would help us in the war, and they would help you. Uh, as we make them more adaptable in a wartime environment. So let us test them. <laughs> Give us that technology. We'll, we'll work with you. We'll, we'll report back to you how things work. Uh, and it's actually a clever way of making things a win-win rather than just give us, give us, give us because we need help. Um, okay. Ukraine director calls for trials of Soviet-era war crimes. And this guy is, is hes an interesting figure. I've never heard of him before. Okay, the Russian state should be tried for historical crimes committed by the Soviet Union, uh, says this guy. Uh, Lonza, who was expelled from the Ukrainian Film Academy for expressing his support for Russian filmmakers, right? So he's not exactly a slouch, like, on the other side of the aisle completely, but he was actually trying to be supportive of that, said he need, that there needed to be contrition for the wrongs of the past. So think like South Africa with the, um, I don't even remember what it was, Truth and Reconciliation Project or something along those lines. Uh, history repeats itself when we don't learn from history. Very true. The Kiev trial, also known as the Kiev Nuremberg, took place in January 1946 in the Soviet Union and was one of the first post-Second World War trials convicting German Nazis and their collaborators, 15 defendants, face justice on the atrocities committed by fascist invaders on the territory of the Ukrainian SSR, including statements of the defendants and testimonies of witnesses with survivors of both Auschwitz and Babinyar. So they've had this before. Um, and at the end of this war, there must be a trial against all war crimes that the Russian army and Russian politicians did in Ukraine, but also against the state of the Soviet Union about crimes they did starting from 1917 and ending in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, that's really important because things like the Holodomor uh, happened on Ukrainian soil where uh, Stalin essentially was trying to starve out the Ukrainians for a couple of years. And we don't talk about that. This is, by the way, why Ukraine is, is so nationalist, because when if Russia, the Soviet Union, through Russia, can do that to them, they don't want this to happen again. That's why the Baltic states are so nationalist. They're so, so hawkish to pr protect Ukraine. That's why Poland's so hawkish. Okay, last article. Um, Russia is a European country, but the West is a hybrid war that has forced it, uh, the West hybrid war has forced it to turn to Asia. Okay, it is both European and Asian. That's true. 
For Russia, the country's enormous natural wealth and ability to fully support itself with resources to make it unnecessary in principle to consider external relations as a vitally important part of its own development strategy. What's it saying? We don't need anybody else. We could just be totally self-sufficient. Lies. You can be, but your GDP is going to plummet. Your ability to actually have the things that you need is going to fall like a rock. And you talk all the time in RT, particularly about... Um, well, we don't need these Western companies. See, we now have Cool Cola and we have Street and we have fake McDonald's. And, and But it, it's still your your standard of living goes down each step with as you lose trade. So that that's a lie. And by the way, he says here, in, in reality, Russia, like its main geostrategic adversary, the U.S. is one of only two countries in the world that can survive at least basic sense by relying entirely on its domestic resources. Okay. The U.S. could survive, but it would its standard of living would plummet if it was not. Look, the way that it's like violating all everything I know about economics. OK, the way that you succeed economically is by greater production and free trade. That's pretty much it. OK, and if you cut off the free trade side of it, it's going to be bad. It just, it just will be bad. Um, and they talk about, you know, perhaps economic limitations, it's eastward pivot that is toward Asia and other countries. Now they admitted like North Korea, or South Korea doesn't want to play with them. Japan doesn't want to play with them. Taiwan certainly doesn't want to play with them. There's a number of Asian countries that the U S will keep from, you know, uh, trading with, uh, Russia. It's not that it's, it's that they don't want to play with you because you're kind of a dictator. That's a loose cannon. And we don't know exactly what we're going to get out of that. Um, Moscow has significantly expanded its presence in various Asian international formats. But he talked about China strong, uh, beyond, it's not progressed beyond establishing truly strong ties with China. And this is the last thing I want to say. China is actually becoming the big brother. It's, it's a very weird thing to see, but the, the more China stays out of it, and China knows this, the more China stays out of it and just watches as Russia kind of collapses, the more, look like even the image you have here of the height ratio of China to Russia, I think that's what's kind of happening, where China used to be the little brother to Russia, and China is now the bigger brother, and Russia is reducing its stature because it's destroying itself. It, it's... Uh, as as it tries to smash um, Ukraine, it is hurting itself in a process, and China is going to become the, the leader, the leading figure in that region. And I think that's pretty much what's going to happen. All right, so all that to recap, uh, Ukraine, what's happening here today, and especially from what we saw in the ISW, uh, the counteroffensive is making huge progress. It's going well for Ukraine. It's not going well for Russia. And that's where we are on today, Sunday, September 4th. And thank you for your time. If you're still listening, please subscribe. I'll be back tomorrow.